Item number SCP-2063 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-2063 should be mounted on a stand when not being tested, and stored in a secure enclosure no smaller than 3m by 3m by 3m. The stand itself should be securely mounted atop a 1.5m tall pedestal affixed to the floor or otherwise securely fixed in the center of the room. Other than during approved testing, no object or obstruction other than the plastic stand is to come within a 1m spherical radius, centered on the point of contact between the ship and the stand, unless that object directly supports the stand itself. At least once every 60 days, SCP-2063 is to be removed from its plastic stand, carried around the enclosure for a period of 5 minutes, and then placed back onto its stand. This procedure has been demonstrated to prevent SCP-2063 from acting autonomously. However, in the event that SCP-2063 spontaneously attacks personnel or raises its shields, personnel are advised to immediately put down any tools or weapons, move more than two meters away from SCP-2063, and wait for SCP-2063 to lower its shields. This typically occurs after five minutes of inactivity. When its shields are down, SCP-2063 is generally considered safe to approach and can be manually retrieved. SCP-2063 should be continually monitored by electronic means for EM and radio transmissions, as well as movement and any unscheduled autonomous activity should be logged. All tests involving landing events must be scheduled in advance and approved by Site Management at Level 3 or higher, and should only be attempted within SCP-2063's secure enclosure. Outdoor testing is expressly prohibited. Landing events involving maps, globes, and other depictions of real locations are forbidden except as required by O5 Command. Destructive materials testing is currently prohibited. See Addendum 1 below. Deliberate observation of SCP-2063's autonomous behavior requires prior written approval from the Site's Security Director. Description. SCP-2063 is a resin model of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701, resembling the ship of the same name from the 1966 American television show, Star Trek. It measures approximately 28 centimeters in length at its longest point. It includes a battery enclosure, currently empty, with a removable cover and a black plastic display stand. Materials testing has revealed that the main bulk of the model is a solid mass of polyoxymethylene, laced with trace amounts of various heavy metals, including some radioactive isotopes, which have not been observed to lose mass as they decay, as well as traces of Cibercron F scarlet dye and human DNA. SCP-2063's primary anomalous effect occurs when the ship is removed from its stand. Subjects handling the ship report auditory hallucinations consistent with the main theme of the original Star Trek television series, as well as various iconic sound effects reminiscent of the show. If the ship is then placed onto any object in the room other than its stand, the room containing SCP-2063 undergoes a landing event as outlined below. In an SCP-2063 landing event, the room containing SCP-2063 becomes separated from the facility, appearing black and impenetrable and emitting no radiation except for a constant surface temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and radio waves which propagate normally between the interior of the room and the surrounding area. This makes it possible for researchers to communicate with test subjects inside the room during a landing event. Subjects in the room with SCP-2063 during a landing event likewise no longer perceives the outside world, other than the aforementioned behavior of radio waves. Instead, beyond the door and any windows, subject reports vistas of alien worlds, often corresponding either visually or thematically with the object SCP-2063 was placed upon. Furthermore, Placing SCP-2063 on similar objects often results in the room visiting the same world in successive tests. Examples of worlds that can be reliably accessed in this manner include Experiment ID Number SCP-2063 placed upon and resulting Xenoscape LE-003 Standard Conference Table A gray cityscape devoid of life LE-005 Balsa Wood Dresser a series of flat mesas apparently made out of balsa wood. Constant pecking noises were audible, coming from underground. LE-018 Pepperoni Pizza Hot 
a series of vast underground chasms lined with pulsating, apparently organic masses. Molten lava visible at the bottom of the largest chamber. LE-019 Pepperoni Pizza Cooled Same as previous tests except lava replaced with volcanic rock and wall grow dead and decaying. Plant flagged by test subjects in LE-018 was still present, but appeared chewed. LE-023 Poster depicting an annotated map of Earth's moon. Room connected to Earth's actual moon. D-Class were immediately sucked out of the room by explosive decompression. Later, Mayor Ibrium Outpost personnel confirmed the presence of human remains, initiated cleanup. Containment procedures updated to preclude the use of maps without O5 approval. Please refer to document 2063-LE-L for a comprehensive list of worlds visited to date. Subjects within a room during a landing event can exit the room normally, walk around on the extraterrestrial landscape, and even retrieve objects and artifacts. However, all foreign objects so retrieved dissolve without trace within 20 seconds after the termination of the landing event. A landing event terminates when SCP-2063 is picked up again by a human subject or when all subjects affected by the landing event have been terminated. Upon termination of a landing event, the room is again visible and physically accessible from its original location on Earth. It should be noted that D-Class personnel tend to have a high mortality rate during landing events. For reasons that are not well understood, but which have been heavily speculated upon by researchers, D-Class personnel are invariably the first to be terminated by dangers present. Test groups comprised exclusively of researchers tend to fare better, although fatalities can still occur. It has been noted that when a mixed group of researchers and D-Class participate in the same landing event, subjects other than D-Class usually emerge unscathed. For this reason, it is recommended that at least one D-Class personnel accompany any researcher or group of researchers wishing to study a landing event firsthand. SCP-2063 Secondary Anomalous Properties manifest when approximately 70 days have elapsed without the object being handled, or when SCP-2063 perceives a threat to itself. In these situations, SCP-2063 becomes autonomous, and will detach from the stand of its own volition. It behaves in a manner similar to spaceships depicted on the show, flying around the room without apparent regard to gravity or momentum, emitting sweeps of radiation out to two meters and what is presumed to be active scanning, projecting a visible shield around the ship, and discharging energy weapons at threats, out to a maximum range of one meter. Targets have included a pair of wire cutters held by a researcher, a Rockwell-type hardness tester, the emitter of a 4,000-watt CO2 cutting laser, and most of a D-Class personnel who, unprompted, attempted to unscrew the main sensor array. The intelligence of SCP-2063 is a subject of ongoing study, but at this point appears to be quite limited. It does not seem to associate existing threats, such as destructive testing tools, with the individuals holding or operating those tools. In general, it will raise its shields immediately when it detects a threat, vaporize any part of that threat coming within one meter of it, and then lower its shield after the threat has been neutralized or has been out of scanning range for approximately five minutes. It will fly around the inside of its enclosure, but will generally not attempt to pass through open doors, exhibiting behavior similar to that observed in some species of fish when a glass partition is removed from their tank. However, it is emphasized that the Foundation first became aware of SCP-2063's atomic behavior when it used its energy weapons to cut its way out of the high-value material storage locker in which it had been stored for more than 70 days. Refer to Incident Report 2063-02 for details. Up until this point, SCP-2063 had been classified as safe. Due to the projected difficulty of re-establishing containment should SCP-2063 ever seriously attempt the breach, current containment procedures are designed to reduce the likelihood of any unscheduled autonomous activity manifesting in the first place. On September 8, 2012, SCP-2063 began transmitting the Fibonacci sequence. It has not, however, responded to any Foundation attempts to communicate. The resurgence of this transmission is often one of the first signs of atomic activity when the object had not been handled for more than 70 days. Addendum 1 Following Destructive Materials Test 2063-002 in which researchers attempted to remove a small portion of the main sensor dish, 
SCP-2063 has resisted all subsequent attempts at destructive testing with overwhelming, sometimes lethal force. Special containment procedures have been updated to establish best practices for this contingency. Congratulations. By reading this message, you have just told an alien piece of hardware what to do. Oh, don't worry. It's not in your workstation. We got it at the other end of a secure wired connection in sub-basement 03. Ever since one of the lab boys figured out how to make it talk, we've left this message here, both as a calling card and as a sort of aptitude test. By accessing this file, you just passed that test. You see. Sometimes the objects retrieved from SCP-2063 don't melt away after you end the landing event. Sometimes we connect to really weird places that are nonetheless real. It's not just the moon. We've found computers, trinkets, clothing, creatures have followed us home. We get an occasional SCP object, but most of it is just stuff. And we never seem to find the people who created the stuff. There was one test that we performed early on, which was completely expunged from the records. Even the numbering system was changed to suppress awareness of it. Since then, we have been quietly moving key people around. We need as many people as we can get who can do what you've just done. You are hereby ordered to report to SCP-2063's enclosure at 0500 hours tomorrow. Ignore the testing procedures you were given at that time. Once the chamber door closes behind you, you will hear a buzzer. That sound is your indication that the cameras are no longer recording. Retrieve the ship from its stand. Remove the ship's battery cover. Place the battery cover on the floor exterior side down, and sit the ship down on top of it. Then step through the door. You will receive further instructions on the other side. Suffice it to say that you are about to embark upon what may be the most important experiment this institution has ever conducted. Welcome aboard. 05-9 Item number SCP-1959 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures As of this writing, SCP-1959 is yet to be contained. All observatories within 50 degrees north and 73.2 degrees south of the equator are to be placed within the Foundation's watch list, and amnesiac is to be administered to every witness. Should it be captured, a specialized containment unit has been set aside at site. Description. SCP-1959 is an unmarked white spacesuit, similar in make to Soviet's SK-1 model, used in Vostok program with few alterations. The suit itself appears to be indestructible. The helmet's visor is badly damaged and misted over, preventing any observation of its interior. So far, all attempts to communicate with SCP-1959 have failed. The subject is also known to emit considerable amounts of gamma radiation. SCP-1959 appears to continuously orbit around the Earth at a reasonably constant speed. Subject's position can vary between low to high Earth orbit at any given moment. SCP-1959 will ram through any obstacle encounters, causing grave structural damage. While the subject is capable of independent movement, it remains motionless most of the time. On the occasion the subject does move, its body language shows signs of extreme distress and it will sometimes make attempts to break its visor. There are recorded instances where SCP-1959 hovered in place for a certain period of time before moving off again. According to observations made to such events, the subject appears to be resisting some unseen force before being pulled away. Addendum 01 SCP-1959 was first observed floating in low Earth orbit by the crew aboard on 1971. Observation lasted for three hours before the crew members lost sight of the subject. Addendum 02 After some research on Soviet space program and declassified files, we have a strong reason to suspect that SCP-1959 is either Alexei, Andrei, or Sergei. Further research is necessary to fully ascertain the identity of SCP-1959. Doctor. Darkness slowly turned into light once more. Blinding, red, fiery light. At first it was amazing. 
the sun rising to greet his vision, warming his bones, just as everything else since the accident, though, it was a false warmth, a false feeling of hope. Let go. Sure, the first couple of times he managed to turn his head to view the earth, he was filled with the hope that he would be brought back, that somehow his comrades would find him and bring him home. Now, he's glad they didn't. It would have meant their end. You can return home. It somehow tuned in to the radio, too. Over the years, he heard a constant stream of broadcasts from his home. Oh, what the world had become. That was probably just to lure him in, though. Get him to fall. But he wouldn't. Not now. Not ever. They want you home. Look how they try. He wasn't sure exactly how it happened, or exactly what it was. One day he was on a shuttle, a secret flight into space, and the next, well, he was where he is now, and this presence was with him. You can't hold out much longer. At first, he just thought it was a figment of his imagination, a way to keep himself sane in the cold void of space. But as he began to drift towards the Earth, he began to realize he wasn't drifting. He was being pulled, and the closer he got, the stronger the presence was, and it felt… wrong. 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 So he stopped it. He's not sure how he did this either. He stopped himself, stopped his unnatural inertia, caught himself in the Earth's orbit. Oh, how the presence raged, but what he didn't expect was for it to defend itself so well. Can't stop. Weak. Pitiful thing. It wrapped itself around him, and his suit, not something solid, just a presence. And it was that presence that made him unstoppable. Anything he touched broke before its velocity and density. Even those who were sent up to collect him could do nothing but fail and die. But you know what? You will fall. I stopped it. I saved my comrades. I saved us. Or rather, just halted what was inevitable. But I'm not going to let go. Even though I'm trapped in this body, in this suit, I won't let go. Sometimes I even gain control. I smash my visor. To expose it to the vacuum of space when it was ingrained so deeply in me would kill us both. But it's too smart for that. Too old, and too smart. So I will continue to hold. I will continue to be the harbinger of death whose blade hovers above the throat of the earth. And on the day that this son of a bitch dies, on the day this presence realizes it can't beat us, I'll finally come home. Home. Item number SCP-1548 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-1548 is currently uncontainable due to its status as a stellar body. It is to be observed by astronomical personnel at Research Unit currently located at Sark. Three small-scale radio telescopes are currently in use to allow for 24-hour message reception. All received messages are to be transcribed and transmitted to the SCP-1548 database at site. Mobile Task Force Gamma-5 is currently assigned the task of suppressing knowledge of the object's characteristics in the mass media. Description: SCP-1548 is the Foundation term for PSR B0531-21, an optical pulsar in the Crab Nebula. Originally discovered in 1942 by various scientific organizations, the anomalous nature of the star was not known until 1968, when Agent then an astronomer at began observations via radio telescope. Radio observations revealed the star was, in fact, accelerating towards the solar system, and that it was pulsing in Morse code. The first fully transcribed SCP-1548 message, translated from Russian and broadcast in three bursts, reads as follows. I wake. I see all. And find it lacking. SCP-1548 normally pulses at a rate of approximately 30 Hz, although higher transmission rates have been recorded. See Addendum SCP-1548-A. Over the course of the next ten years, the star was observed to accelerate to approximately 0.85 c. During this period, the pulsar began to transmit increasingly hostile messages, with common phrases being, you cannot hide, and only death. Having reached its apparent maximum velocity by unknown means in late 1978, the pulsar's messages changed, becoming significantly more erudite and coherent. It was at this point that SCP-1548 began to demonstrate awareness of those observing it. Messages begin to take on a personal tone, insulting those observing the object. 
Messages simultaneously received on multiple telescopes will threaten personnel using all telescopes. Messages sent while telescopes are recording automatically, without human involvement, are normally general threats against humanity as a whole, although prompting the establishment of observation posts at these specific sites. The means by which SCP-1548 apparently predicts the future in order to time the reception of its pulses is unknown. Addendum SCP-1548-A on 1980-05, on medical leave from Foundation duties, accidentally directed a small optical telescope in the general direction of the Crab Nebula. The telescopes at Sark recorded the following. I just remembered this, the coordinates of all SCP secure facilities, and have the personal information of the O5. Following this transmission, the star's pulse rate increased from 30 Hz to well over 1 kHz, necessitating the use of high-speed cameras to record the message. Over the next eight hours, SCP-1548 transmitted totaling more than a gigabyte of information. This was the longest continual message to date. Addendum SCP-1548-B SCP-1548 is reclassified as Keter by order of O5. I don't care if it gets here in 5700 years, it knows too much, O5. Addendum SCP-1548-C After the major solar flare on November 4, 2003, the Sark facility received a brief message stating, Your little world will be next. Comparable messages have been received after every significant solar event since that date. Item number SCP-2100 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Site Was built above SCP-2100 and is located in Antarctica at the Earth's southern pole. SCP-2100 is publicly concealed as the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. A cover-up organization has been established through the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Addendum 2100-1 Foundation cover-up of Event 2100 Omega is ongoing. Efforts are underway to retroactively alter astronomical maps to administer appropriate amnesiacs as necessary, and to monitor and subdue the publishing of any material regarding the effects of Event 2100 Omega. Site is to remain operational indefinitely with standard maintenance and guard staff to maintain the integrity and secrecy of SCP-2100 components. Description. SCP-2100 is a large subterranean complex, believed extraterrestrial in origin. SCP-2100 extends approximately 7,390 meters below ground, with 2,718 levels, and has an approximate floor area of 738,905,600 square meters. Geological analysis of the surrounding rock indicates that SCP-2100 was constructed 1.253 billion years ago, in its current position. Small-scale fissures indicate that the Antarctic Tectonic Plate has been partially fractured as a result of sliding around SCP-2100. Research in 1960 confirmed that SCP-2100 perpetually broadcasts a dense stream of neutrinos towards the center of the Earth, which is then redirected at Earth's core through unknown means. Regardless of Earth's relative position and orientation, this beam maintains focus towards a fixed coordinate point located within the center bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. SCP-2100 has been fully mapped, with three primary features designated SCP-2100-1 through 3. 2100-1 is an area comprising parts of floors 25 through 29 and contains a concentration of display readouts and input controls. Conduits throughout the entire complex join at junction relays and all eventually terminate at 2100-1, indicating that it is the control center for the entire complex. Displays in 2100-1 are alert and active, and appear to perpetually display real-time information using a combination of graphics and an indecipherable alien language. This information is largely meaningless without knowledge of the systems or the language. An attempt is underway to interact with 2100-1 in an effort to learn more. 
See document 2100-114. Displays in 2100-1 are dead and unresponsive. 2100-2 is an area comprising parts of the lowest 271 levels, and is the source of the neutrino transmission beam. It is believed to hold an immense focusing mechanism which directs neutrinos produced by 2100-3 into a beam 271 meters in diameter, with an average neutrino density of 27 million quadrillion neutrinos per square centimeter. 2100-3 is a perfectly spherical section comprising the central sections of level 1,223-1495. There are several hundred shuttered transparent viewing apertures located along the equatorial belt of 2100-3. When unshuttered, these apertures allow limited filtered wavelengths of visible light to pass through. Visual indications show that 2100-3 houses what appears to be a miniature neutron star, designated 2100-4. Gravimetric and electromagnetic readings do not pick up any usual activity near the vicinity of 2100-4. Either 2100-4 does not produce gravitational electromagnetic fields, or 2100-3 effectively blocks them. In addition to the primary faculties, SCP-2100 also houses a small section believed to be an abandoned alien living quarters, several large cavernous rooms of unknown purpose, and approximately 2.71 billion meters of conduit connecting 2100-1, 2, and 3. Document 2100-114 Partial Transcript of Video Log 2100 Epsilon Forward On October 7, 1960 After Years of studying the alien language, the control displays and conduit maps, the first attempt was made to interact with SCP-2100-1 control consoles. Fifty-four researchers are present, as well as Site Lead Researcher Dr. Twenty-seven researchers are seated in front of control stations, while Dr. Gives instructions. Displays are active. Commence log. Dr. Is talking to various aides. Alright, let us begin. Station Theta. Hit Control 8-12, just like we rehearsed. Display changes from a purely text readout to a graphical readout, dominated by a large spinning sphere. Good. Station Lambda. Please turn Dial 1-12 counterclockwise by 10 degrees. Okay. 15 degrees. 20. 25. 28. I can't turn it anymore. That's as far as it goes. Confirmed dial maximum at approximately 27.1 degrees. Confirmed. As expected. Doctor is speaking into his radio headset. Team Sigma, confirm the anticipated possible shift in Dash 4 over. Negative. Confirmed over. Alright team, looks like we're in simulation mode, just as we hoped. We'll proceed with test 2003-0. Station Mu, hit Control 3-1. Yes, the larger oval. Log redacted for brevity. See document 2100-117 for full log. Doctor is speaking into his radio headset. Yes sir, we believe we've got the basics down. We can predictably adjust the rotational period, the luminosity, the fusion rate, the temperature, even the graviton output. No, we haven't reliably modified the magnetic flux field, but we did see non-negligible deviations during test 77 over. Yes, we are still confident that Console Alpha will apply changes real-time, over. Confirmed, over. Absolutely. Over and out. Okay, team, return to your stations. We are going to recreate Test 2004-2. Log redacted for brevity. See Document 2100-117 for full log. Doctor is speaking into his radio headset. Team Sigma, be prepared to confirm luminosity adjustment. Remember. We are expecting no more than a .001% change, over. Okay, Alpha. On my mark, I want you to hit Control Alpha Alpha 1. The big one. Mark. Team Sigma, confirm luminosity change, over. Confirm. We have control. Great job. Talking ceases. Everyone in the room falls unconscious instantly. Doctor Alpha Station Researcher and Bravo Station Researcher have vanished. All displays have gone black. Medical staff rush into SCP-2100-1 and begin reviving the team. Entire team has been revived with no permanent injuries. End log. Frame by frame analysis. Below is a frame by frame analysis of video log 2100 Epsilon at approximately 4 hours 26 minutes and 9 seconds. 
video was captured at 30 frames per second, with frames approximately every 33 milliseconds. Doctor is standing behind Alpha Station, no abnormal activity present. Two unknown entities now exist in the middle of the room. Resolution is low, but entities appear to be floating sycamore seed-shaped distortions. There are several spotlights illuminating them, and while they seem somewhat translucent on camera, they cast large shadows, longer and more distorted than their shape would suggest. The entities are now in front of separate display panels. The entities appear to have opened previously unknown access hatches and are interacting with the interior hardware. Researchers begin to fall limp. An assortment of hardware floating in the middle of the room where the entities first appeared. Hardware is believed to have originated from within the console interiors. Doctor Alpha Station Researcher and Bravo Station Researcher are floating in a vaguely fetal position near the hardware. The entities, the hardware, and Doctor have vanished, and all display panels are shut. No further anomalous activities recorded. Final note. After Event 2100 Epsilon, all displays appear dead. SCP-2100-4 returned to its original luminosity. Further attempts to interact with displays have proved fruitless. No further sightings or evidence of the anomalous entities or missing personnel have been reported. Document 2100-154 Memorandum from Dr. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, January 8, 1960 Dr. In response to your rather unusual inquiry, let me remind you that relativity dictates that no signal can travel faster than light, not even massless, sterile neutrinos. While there are some well-known physicists exploring the possibility of faster than light particles, they are mostly crackpots well past their prime. I can think of no reason you would be exploring this question beyond an exercise of fiction, so let me reiterate, nothing can travel faster than light. But, if we do throw out common sense and start idly entertaining the realm of fiction, you can see from my attached calculations that your theoretical beam would be traveling 27,000 light-years to its destination, and therefore an instantaneous transmission would have to reach an estimated 100 trillion times the speed of light. The amount of energy needed to perform your little theoretical hop would of course be infinite. Although you can see in Figure 3.2 that once you actually pass light speed, the energy requirements start to actually decrease the faster you go. You get slower the more energy you have weighing yourself down, while losing energy speeds you up. If relativity still means anything in this new theoretical universe, then you can see from Diagram 4.1 that anyone able to travel faster than light would also have the ability to travel along a closed, time-like curve, meaning they would have the option of traveling through time as well as space. As to your final question regarding the resources necessary to construct such an apparatus, we cannot even idly speculate. Suffice to say, it is more than every nation on Earth has at its disposal. Thank you for the donation. It was pleasant to hear from you again, and I wish you luck in your future endeavors. Regards, Doctor. Document 2100-421 Summary of Event 2100 Omega On December 4, 1994, the O5 Council issued a top priority order to site, directing senior personnel to focus all efforts on interrupting the stream of neutrinos emanating from SCP-2100. Since neutrinos pass through nearly all solid matter, extreme measures were necessary to interrupt the beam. On October 17, 1996, Site Director made a formal request to the O5 Council asking permission to use SCP. The request detailed a plan to create a spatial anomaly which would redirect the neutrino stream away from the Milky Way galaxy towards Galaxy 3C252, which lies near the edge of known space. Two months later, the O5 Council approved the request. On May 19, 1999, SCP was activated within SCP-2100, creating a bend in space-time to redirect the neutrino stream. Immediately the neutrino stream ceased. The neutron star within 2100-1, being closely monitored, slowed from a rotational period of 0.5 milliseconds to 500 microseconds. At the exact moment of interruption, Reports began coming in from civilian and Foundation observatories all over the world. 226 supernovae were observed to erupt throughout the Milky Way, 34 new black holes were discovered, and 11 previously documented stars disappeared with no trace. Most activity was centered in and around the center bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. None of the activity posed any threat to Earth. 
Efforts to reinstate the neutrino stream have been unsuccessful. Request by Site Director to reclassify event Omega-2100 as an XK scenario and utilize reality-altering SCPs to retroactively prevent event Omega-2100 have been denied. Item number SCP-2399 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Due to SCP-2399's location and nature, physical means of containment are currently impossible. Implanted Foundation agents and major observatories are to contain footage or images of SCP-2399. An ongoing misinformation campaign is in effect which has thus far been able to completely suppress any knowledge pertaining to SCP-2399 from public awareness. Foundation satellites in orbit around Jupiter are to maintain constant vigilance of SCP-2399's reconstruction efforts, and make all attempts to hinder that process should SCP-2399 reach a minimum of 75% completion. Additionally, a perimeter of long-range electromagnetic jamming satellites barrier array, has been situated in high Jupiter orbit. Any transmissions intercepted by this array are to be summary decoded and logged. In the event of SCP-2399 surpassing 75% completion or an information breach in the jamming perimeter, necessary Foundation personnel will engage Protocol Legionnaire 5 see Addendum 2399-L5, given its completion by that time. Description. SCP-2399 is a massive, complex mechanical structure currently located in Jupiter's lower atmosphere. Since its visual discovery in 1963, SCP-2399 has been observed to use highly advanced antimatter-based weaponry to create spatial disruptions and devastating atmospheric observable as a large red vortex, commonly known as the Great Red Spot. SCP-2399 appears to be damaged possibly due to an impact with the moon Io before coming to rest in its current position. SCP-2399 has been observed releasing a multitude of small, octopoid repair drones in efforts to repair the damage it has taken. Some of these drones will remain near SCP-2399, while others will patrol nearby moons or deeper into the gases of Jupiter itself, in search of parts that SCP-2399 is missing. Computer models estimate that SCP-2399 is at 59% completion, with a current rate of .78% annually. This rate has increased from an estimated 0.12% in 1970. Despite its damaged state, SCP-2399 seems to possess a limitless power supply, advanced electromagnetic shielding, matter-disrupting weaponry, the ability to repair damage done to itself, and a precise tracking and targeting system. See Addendum 2399-2B Due to the large difference in technological advancement between the creator of SCP-2399 and our own, for all intents and purposes, SCP-2399 is currently indestructible by human means. In theory, SCP-2399 might be left vulnerable by a powerful enough electromagnetic pulse. Unfortunately, this technology does not yet exist. Since 1971, SCP-2399 has been the recipient of an unending stream of electromagnetic-based communications originating from the Triangulum Galaxy, roughly three million light-years from Earth. The means of SCP-2399's travel to our solar system and the means of its communications are all unknown. From 1971 to 1985, SCP-2399 continuously received a single encoded message which, through code-breaking and translation efforts, appeared to be a command to repair the damage it incurred upon entering our solar system. After this time, the Barrier Array was established to intercept these messages. This coincided with a period of radio silence from the origin of the communications until 1996 when a different order began transmitting. The Barrier Array has thus far prevented SCP-2399 from receiving this command. See Addendum 2399-COM Log. SCP-2399 Discovery Notes SCP-2399 was originally observed, albeit unknowingly, by Giovanni Cassini in 1665. The following is taken directly from Cassini's journal on the event translated from Italian to English. October 8, 1665 
I have observed something extraordinary in the heavens. Last night, as I gazed through my looking glass, I saw what appeared to be a star of great luminescence streaked through the far reaches of our solar system. I have never recorded an object moving so fast. It has surpassed the outer planets in fewer than two hours. As I watched, by my own two eyes, I saw it slow as it closed on Jupiter, making a sharp turn, and disappear into the planet itself. I saw many bursts of light afterward, but although I continued to peer at it until the sun broke, I saw no additional disturbances in the night sky. I must continue to document these changes, and will alert my colleagues when the day is upon me. October 15, 1665 I took Peter to my observation point last night, but a week from the night I saw the fire rain upon Jupiter in the heavens. He brought along his own looking glass, and together we aimed our view upon the giant. To our surprise, a magnificent change has occurred. Where once the distant world only showed bands of color, there is now a great red spot where the star came to rest on the surface of Jupiter. Peter was incredulous, of course, that such an amazing discovery could have taken place before our very eyes. I will continue to take note of this. October 18, 1665 Tonight as I peered through my looking glass, I swear on my life that I observed what looked to me like explosions and starbursts emanating from our red spot. I fear my mind is playing tricks on me, for there has been no record of such violent outbursts by a heavenly body since the dawn of astronomy. I will consult with Peter on the morrow, and hopefully glean from him some advice on the matter. October 19, 1665 Peter sees the same as I. As I approached him with my concerns, he leveled the same with me, and through our following discussion we concluded that it must be a powerful reaction to the falling star I saw upon the first night and not a product of our own shortcomings. I am left wondering what cataclysmic event must be taking place upon our heavenly neighbor. Our work to document this must go on. Addendum 2399-2B At Hours on Barrier Unit 53 observed one of SCP-2399's repair drones closing on a piece of debris, quickly determined to be part of a damaged communications array. Because of the nature of this specific component, and the ramifications of allowing SCP-2399 to recover it, it was ordered that Barrier Unit 45 fire upon the drone with its onboard concussion batteries. Batteries were discharged, however the drone appeared undamaged. Footage obtained by Barrier Unit 53 shows that, while the payload in question was launched towards the repair drone, it was destroyed within 5 kilometers of the target by additional charges originating from SCP-2399. Command lost contact with Barrier Unit 45 15 seconds after initial discharge, with video observations showing SCP-2399 the resulting spatial anomaly originating in the termination of Barrier Unit 45 by Barrier Units 44, 51, and 55. Under no circumstances are any Barrier Units to further engage either SCP-2399 or drones released by SCP-2399. Addendum 2399-2C Project Gigas After the events of It was decided that necessary force would be authorized to destroy or incapacitate SCP-2399. Using Foundation resources, as well as resources from 45 nations, notably and a platform of warheads bearing Megaton payloads and warheads bearing EMP detonators was launched and placed in orbit around Europa on at hours with orders from 15 heads of state and 05 05 05 05 and 05 the entire payload of Project Gigas was launched towards SCP-2399. Efforts to develop alternative methods of eliminating SCP-2399 are currently underway. Addendum 2399-L5 So, SCP-2399. Have you ever sat and wondered, maybe after you hear about a car accident on a street you were just on, or a bombing in a city you were visiting, just how lucky you are to be alive? Just how many things have to go right for you to continue to exist? A few seconds too late, a few seconds too early, and somebody reaches for something they dropped, and a busload of people run into another busload of people? Sometimes this kind of thing does happen, as we've seen far too often. But that's what we're here for. To protect those who can't protect themselves from things that they wouldn't even know to protect themselves from. 
We can't do it all, though. As many things as we've been able to contain, as many things we've been able to keep under lock that would threaten to destroy us all, still far too many remain that we can't do anything about. Whether they're too big or too fast or too powerful, any of these things could blink and wipe humanity from existence. The fact that they haven't done so yet is just luck. SCP-2399, however, is different. We have little information regarding SCP-2399's motives, origins, and full capabilities. We do not understand how it is capable of communicating over such large distances, or why those who constructed it, if it was in fact constructed, sent it to us in the first place. We do not know what would happen if SCP-2399 is able to fully repair itself, or if part of our array would break down and a message would get through. We do not know this, so we must assume the worst. Judging by what we've seen, were SCP-2399 to have reached Earth, it would have led to our timely destruction. But sometimes humanity gets a little help. Sometimes something steps in the way of the apocalypse. For us and for SCP-2399, it was Jupiter. As SCP-2399 began to slow on its approach to Earth, Cassini saw what we have been able to ascertain, that SCP-2399 struck Io, was damaged and was unable to escape the gravitational pull of Jupiter. Its weapons activated as they were intended, but it was Jupiter that experienced Doomsday, not us. Eventually, though, it's likely that SCP-2399 will resume full functionality, and will likely be able to pull away from Jupiter and proceed to its target. As of now, we can keep hurling bombs and EMPs at it all we want, but we've got no indication that any of it would do so much as scratch the thing. On the contrary, experience dictates it would do nothing at all. If this was to happen now, we would undoubtedly be destroyed. Jupiter has given us time. For now, SCP-2399 will remain there, reassembling itself, while we devise some way to stop it. Like it or not, we are in an arms race with this thing. Our best guess is give us something like 25 years until it is able to hear past our dampening array. Until then, we must seize the opportunity that has been laid before us. We must use the time we have been given, and not let it be wasted. So we devised Protocol Legionnaire. One gigantic EMP, powered by God knows what, followed by a volley of nukes big enough to wipe out our civilization a thousand times over. A blunt plan and simple, and likely futile. Our researchers and researchers around the globe have yet to devise even a way to deliver that kind of pulse, let alone a way to power it. There is no indication whatsoever that we will be able to complete Legionnaire on time, or if it will do what it was intended once it is completed. But we must try. We must do something. Even if we have to drain our banks and empty our minds, we must try. Not often do we get a chance to see the swerving bus that will end our lives, and step out of the way. Jupiter, unknowingly, has offered us that chance. I suggest we take it. Randall McAllen, Director, Barrier Project Site Addendum 2399-COM Log All messages logged are to be understood as having repeated themselves, continuously, until either a new message is logged or a logged instance of radio silence. 1971. Unit is damaged. Repair. Updating orders. Maintain position. Repair. 1985. Period of radio silence. Barrier array is established. Unit is out of range of target. Proceed to planet number 3 in system. Coordinates redacted. Repair. 2015. Unit is out of range of target. Proceed to planet number 3 in system. Coordinates redacted. Priority is target. Cease repairs.